This morning, if you would turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 12, <clears throat> we're going to be <clears throat> excuse me, looking at the last challenge that was brought to Jesus after he cleansed the temple, a question by one of the scribes regarding the greatest commandments. And we read about that in beginning verse 28 through verse 34 of Mark 12. So, Gospel of Mark chapter 12 beginning in verse 28. Would you listen carefully to this? This is God's word. And one of the scribes came and heard them arguing, and recognizing that he had answered them well, asked him, what commandment is the foremost of all? Jesus answered, the foremost is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your hearts, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. And the second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, right, teacher, you have truly stated that he is one, and there is no one else beside him. And to love him with all the heart, and with all the understanding, and with all the strength, and to love one's neighbor as himself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. And when, Jesus, and when Jesus saw that he had answered intelligently, he said to him, You are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one would venture to ask him any more questions. May the Lord bless his word to our understanding this morning. Now, as you know, there's been a series of challenges to our Lord Jesus Christ coming from different groups. The first group came basically from the chief priests, the scribes, and the elders that had control of the temple, challenging him on the authority by which he did the things that he did, casting out all the merchandisers from the temple. The second challenge came from the Pharisees and the Herodians who, of course, were trying to trick him with their question about taxation. And then last week we saw that of the Sadducees who brought questions regarding the resurrection. Again, each of these challenges meant to, uh, well, to discredit Jesus Christ so they might have a reason to accuse him, arrest him, and get him out of the way. Now this last question is a little bit different than those previous questions because it appears in this case that the scribe who comes to him didn't come with any ulterior motive. He didn't come to try to trip Jesus up, but rather he came with a sincere question. Now it's helpful to know, of course, who the scribes were and why the scribe might have had this particular question. Uh, scribes were called scribes because they wrote, and what they wrote were uh, basically copies of the scriptures. It was their job to reproduce the scriptures, and of course they did it in a very meticulous way. And as we know, because of that, there have been very few very few, very minor changes that have crept into the text over the years. And that, um, I can't even exactly explain why that was. The scribes were so careful. I mean, they even had counted what was the very center consonant in any particular book and how many uh, letters it was to get to that particular consonant. And as they would copy the scriptures, they would, uh, first of all, they made, I think it was uh, three errors. They would destroy the the document. They would correct each error. They correct the first one, the second one, but on the third one, they would destroy the document and begin over. And once they made it through the whole document and and uh, got what they considered to be a, a perfect copy, they would count to the very center consonant. And if it turned out to be different than the one they expected, they would destroy the document and begin over again. They were very careful, but because of this carefulness and because this is what they did, you know, virtually as as a living. They knew the scriptures very well. Now the scribe, of course, was a student of the Old Testament. And he comes to Jesus Christ. He hears what Jesus has been answering the others. He recognizes that he has been speaking well. He's been giving good answers, giving intelligent answers. And he asks what appears to be a sincere question. What commandment is foremost of all? Which of all the commandments is most important to God? Now, the answer to this question, of course, is, is very important. Which 
of these things is most pleasing to him? Which of all the commandments is the one that he is most concerned that be kept? And of course, if you are interested in honoring the Lord and serving him, the answer to this question will also be very important to you. This morning, I want us to consider Jesus' answer, which, of course, is, is quite plain. But I think it does require a little bit of explanation, maybe not so much for you all, because you may have heard this many times, but certainly for anyone in the future that may perhaps hear this tape, look at these notes, uh, watch the video. And, of course, we need to be reminded ourselves this morning. But I would like for us to consider three things from this text. The first one is that the greatest commandment is to love God and, of course, to love him with our whole being. The second point, to look at the second greatest commandment, which is to love your neighbor as you love yourself. But then thirdly, we do need to understand from the example of this particular scribe that knowing and agreeing that this is the greatest commandment and it is better than other sacrifices that could possibly be made, that that isn't enough to enter into the kingdom of heaven. To enter the kingdom of heaven, quite literally, you do have to keep this commandment. But again, we'll understand, you have to keep it through the Lord Jesus Christ. He's the only one who has kept it. And so you need his righteousness and you need his power to grow into his likeness. So first of all, let's consider that the greatest commandment is to love God with your whole being. As Jesus answers this question, he begins with what is called the Shema, which is the, um, you might say, the confession of Israel, the most important confession they had to make. And that is, of course, what Jesus quotes. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord, and you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, and with all your strength. Now, why does Jesus begin with the Shema? because that is where the greatest commandment is found. Jesus, first of all, begins by pointing out there is only one God, and that certainly is true. There is only one God. We are not polytheists. The Jews were not polytheists. Certainly Jesus is not. Don't believe in many gods. But of course, there are three persons in the Godhead, and we're going to see that this morning. There is only one God, and the most important commandment, of course, has to center upon him that we are to love him with, again, all the heart, mind, soul, and strength with the whole of our beings. Now, why is it that you need to love God in this way? Well, again, I think this goes without saying. You owe your existence to him. You owe your, your continuing existence to him. Uh, you owe your salvation to him. I mean, God has not only made you, and he not only takes care of you as the First, or the, I think it's the children's catechism says. But of course, the Lord has also redeemed you if you have trusted in him, which means he has saved you from what you and I so justly deserve, which is an eternity of suffering in hell. God has done a great deal for you, and the only proper response is to love him most of all. But that's not the only reason why you should love him. You should also love him because it's right to love him because he is worthy to be loved by you. We don't want to just look at the gift and forget about the giver. The gift shows something of the, the heart behind this giver about how gracious he is and how merciful. God is the greatest conceivable being. He is infinite and eternal and unchangeable. But of course, that which makes him most lovely is the fact that this infinite, eternal, and unchangeable being who has all wisdom, power, and glory is adorned with a perfect love of what is good and right, and we call that holiness. That is the reason why you should love him, not only because of what he's done, but because of who he is. God is infinitely beautiful. And you know what beauty does? Beauty draws your heart out to it, to desire it. Well, God has infinite beauty. How much should you love him? Well, you should love him in the way that Jesus tells us, the way that God commanded Israel. Now, is it egotistical for God to require this? I want you to love me with all that is within you. Well, if it was anyone else, it would be egotistical because nobody else deserves that kind of love and devotion. 
But certainly God does because he really is worthy of your love. He is the only one who is. And you are to love him. You are to love him intensely. You are to love him comprehensively. You are to love him with your whole being. Now again, it's easy to say, but is what, is, is what Jesus saying here is that we're supposed to just sort of stand in one place and think about God and just emanate love towards him? Is that what he wants? Just let your heart swell with love and, and that's it. No, the Lord actually tells you how it is he wants you to love him, how he wants this, this affection and this desire that you have for him to work itself out in your life. Now, it's not just any way you might choose to show it. I mean, there's so many people that, that, so many professing Christians that sort of devise ways to show their love to God. If I just do this, then, then this will show God that I love him or this. And again, uh, you know, the Lord in the Old Testament told the people of God, and he tells us in the New Testament as well, how it is he wants us to love him, but sadly, the people of God have often tried to innovate, and when they did, it didn't have the best consequences. Uh, Nadab and Abihu, the two sons of Aaron, decided they, they would show, uh, actually, we don't know what was behind what they were doing, but I can't imagine any other reason why they would do it, where they mixed up some kind of strange concoction and put it on the altar of God as an expression of worship, and God struck them down because it wasn't what he commanded. And we often use those passages to remind ourselves that when we worship God, that we need to do it in the way that he has commanded because that is how we show him honor. And by the way, that's also how we show him love. How do we love God? We love God in the way that he has told us he wants to be loved. We don't try to be innovative. I mean, God's not going to be uh, you know, uh, happy if we think, you know, okay, well, if I build a ship and I sail it you know, to another island and I do it in the name of God, that that's somehow going to please him. Or if I do something innovative in worship that, that isn't commanded, that that's somehow going to please him. But rather just what he commands. To obey is better than sacrifice. Saul thought that if he spared the animals that the Lord commanded him to destroy and he sacrificed those to the Lord, that was going to make him happy. But it didn't make God happy because Saul did not do what God specifically commanded him to do. If you are to love God with this kind of intensity and this, this comprehensiveness, it has to be in the, in the way that he has commanded you to do it. And the Lord has not kept us, of course, in the dark as to how he wants us to love him. He, he tells us in the commandments, specifically in the first four commandments. He wants us to take him as our God and love him most of all and have nothing else before him, not just false gods or what we think about as false gods, you know, various idols that people worship, but anything that we might love more than him. We must have him first in our hearts as God. He tells us, of course, when we worship him, we should worship him in the way he commands and not in any way that we would want to do it. Of course, if we love him, we wouldn't want to do it any other way. He wants us to love him by treating his name reverently. And what's, what's specifically behind that, of course, is, is not, as we often think about it, not using his name as a swear word, although that certainly would, is sinful. We ought not to do it. But when we make vows to the Lord, we keep those vows. When we make promises to anyone, we keep those promises. That's what it means to, as it were, not lift God's name up to emptiness or to vanity, not to take it in vain. Make sure you keep your word because God is witness of everything we say and everything we do. If we make a promise, we need to keep it. And, of course, we love God by honoring him on his Sabbath, which in the New Testament is the, uh, the first day of the week, the day our Lord Jesus entered into his rest. This is the day that the Lord wants us to set aside from, from everything else we do in this world so that we might spend the day with him. He wants us to spend the whole day with him. And actually, if you love him, that's what you'll want to do. And if you want to show him you love him, you'll certainly give him that day. But it is also a reminder that our whole life belongs to him and we ought to give to him 100%. 
every day, but specifically on the Lord's Day, we set it aside to spend it with Him. This is how we show Him that we love Him. And again, in order to do these things in a way that shows this love, we have to do it with, with a kind of heart behind it that would be honoring to Him, with that kind of intensity that He desires. To give these things to Him with your whole being, as best as you possibly can with a whole heart, not grudgingly, you know, as if somebody had to force you to do it. God is not pleased by that. I mean, if, if your wife had to be forced to show uh, any expressions of affections toward you, would you look at that as a sign of love or if it were the other way around? When somebody is forced to do something, that doesn't show love if they do it, but when they do it willingly with their whole heart behind it, that is an expression of love, and that's what we receive as love, and that's what God wants. God wants us to do it not grudgingly and not in an indifferent way. He doesn't want us um, to put anything else before him in what it is he calls us to do, but to give ourselves to this. And God <clears throat> certainly deserves this. He deserves everything we could possibly give him with our lives, and he deserves so much more than that. He deserves that you love him with your whole heart and with every faculty of your soul, with your whole mind and with all your strength. We've already uh, considered I, you know, how important it is and what we're called to do with regard to laying down our lives as a burnt, as it were, a burnt offering or a whole, a whole life sacrifice, as living, a living sacrifices to the Lord, as Paul tells us in Romans chapter 12, to worship the Lord in absolutely everything that we do to be his first and foremost of all at all times. Not to be seeking our own pleasure except to find pleasure in giving him pleasure. Sad thing is, again, as I mentioned before, our sin will move us to seek our own pleasure for pleasure's sake for ourselves rather than seeking to do the things we do because we know it gives pleasure to God and therefore it gives pleasure to me. The Lord redeemed us so that we might find our pleasure in Him and that we might give Him this kind of love and desire. Now, how is it that a person, of course, can do this? And we've already seen that many, many times. You can only do it by the power of His Holy Spirit. By nature, you are unable to do this. Sin is what makes us indifferent. Sin is what makes the unbeliever actually hate God. And that's all you have by nature is sin. But God, through his grace, has given you his Holy Spirit. And that gives you the ability to love God. So how can you love God in this way? How can you have this kind of desire? Well, it's only through the Holy Spirit. You must have the Spirit of God. And if you do not have the Spirit of God, he only comes through the gospel you have to receive Jesus Christ as he is offered to you in the gospel. You need to trust him alone for your salvation. You need to turn from your sins and purpose to follow him. And then, of course, you need to use the means of grace that God has given to you to feed that grace in your soul. So the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, to love him most of all, for him to be the center of your life. But the only way that that can actually happen is if you have the Spirit of God. You need the Spirit. You need to be filled with the Spirit. And He only comes through the gospel by trusting Jesus Christ. Now, the second commandment is to love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus didn't stop with the first one. He also said there was a second. You shall love everyone else too, not just God, but those who are made in His image. Now, you know, Jesus, when he said this, on, uh, it was either in one of the parallel gospels or on another occasion, he was challenged. And a person said, well, who is my neighbor? Thinking that he's done all of these things that he needs to do, and, and yet, uh, uh, you know, that um, if Jesus answers the question in the way that, that he believed it to be true, then he could justify himself and say, well, I've done that too. But Jesus, when he was asked that question, gave the example of the Good Samaritan, as you recall, in Luke chapter 10. Who is your neighbor? Jesus says, a neighbor is anyone who is near to you, who is in need, and you see that need. 
And a good neighbor is one who stops to help a neighbor who is in need. A neighbor is anybody who is near. A neighbor is anyone who is in need. You are to love your neighbor as you love yourself. Now, again, when we talk about this, uh, sometimes we, you know, we understand what this is saying, but to love a person like this, you are to have the same care for the people who are near you as you have for yourself. And again, how do you do this? I mean, are the people of the world doing this? Sometimes it seems like there are good neighbors who are, again, unbelievers, and they do some of these things, but the people of the world do not love in the way that the Lord tells us we are to love our neighbor. When the Lord gave us the Ten Commandments, he didn't tell us just how, how we are to love him. He also told us how we are to love our neighbor in the, the final six commandments. And the way he says you are to do this is by honoring their rightful use of the authority God has given to them as he has set up these different spheres of authority, honoring that authority by protecting their lives, not by destroying them, not by injuring them, as we've seen recently, of course, in the newspaper in Boston, but by protecting their lives, by preserving their purity. And, of course, I mean by that, of course, their sexual purity, and we know that this society has gone rampant in that area, and nobody protects the purity of anyone else, it seems, in our society at all any longer, although there may be hopefully a few. And even within the church, we stumble one another. But the Lord would have us love one another by protecting that purity, by respecting their possessions, not stealing, by protecting their possessions, or, or actually their reputation in this case, by not saying things about other people that aren't true, and by not being jealous of what it is that they have. Now, our Lord tells us that this is how he wants us to love one another, not in the way that the world takes love and perverts it. And I think you can think of numerous examples of what people do in the name of love, and they say they're loving their neighbor. We want the right to enter into this relationship because it's loving. We want to be married. Well, the Lord calls homosexual marriage perversion. And that they're not loving each other, even though they think they may be loving each other. They're actually destroying each other. God says that we would protect the purity of one another by not doing anything contrary to his commandments and that we make sure that we, again, are doing things his way. Again, we can't define what love is. God must define it, and we must do it his way. Now, by the way, the world has perverted all the rest of these commandments as well. We don't want to just pick on them, but the thing is, that is sin, and there is a great deal of sin. We cannot just say... If I do something I think is nice, that's loving. We have to do it God's way. Now, Jesus tells us that this commandment is like the first in a parallel passage. He tells us that to love our neighbor as ourselves is like the first commandment because when we love our neighbor, especially when we love the brethren, we are loving those who are made in the image of God. As a matter of fact, John tells us in 1 John 4, verses 7 and 8, that if we cannot love our brother whom we have seen, that we cannot love God whom we have not seen. When we love our neighbors ourselves, and especially as we love our brethren as we love ourselves, we are actually loving God at the same time. Because when we're loving them, we're loving his image. When we are loving him, we are doing things that are honoring to God. When we love them, we're actually reflecting his nature. On the back of your bulletins, there's a quote that I put in there by John Hooper, which I thought was very insightful. The one by John Hooper, it's the uh, slightly longer one there. He says this, love of man necessarily arises out of love of God. The love of the creature is but the corollary to the love of the creator. This is what the Christian finds, as a matter of fact. His heart is overcharged with love to God. It finds its way out in love to man. His direct service of God cannot, in the nature of things, go very far. He worships God publicly in his house. He glorifies him secretly in the constant outpourings of his heart. He gives of his substance to the maintenance of every cause, which is God's cause. But here it ends. God is so mighty, so self-contained, 
that with all our puny efforts, much cannot be done to serve him. So the Christian looks about to see how he is to show his love for God. He soon finds the way. Clearly, it must be by love for his fellow men. So love for our neighbor is also wrapped up in our love for God. If we love God, we will certainly want to do what God would do. We would certainly want to do what God commands us to do. We would do what God himself would do. God also shows love and the love of benevolence, the love of his kindness and goodness, even to his enemies. Well, that's what the Lord would call us to do as well. The greatest commandment is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And the second greatest commandment is like it. You shall love your neighbor as you love yourself. But in doing the second commandment, you are also fulfilling the first commandment. You are loving God. Now, how, again, can you do this? I mean, how can you love your neighbor as you love yourself? Well, it's only in the same way that you can love God. God must give you that ability. I think we would all admit that people don't come into this world with that ability to love their neighbor. If that were the case, if everybody did this kind of thing, we wouldn't read about explosions to take place at the end of marathons. We wouldn't read about all the atrocities going on in this world. We wouldn't see all the divorces that are going on, all the strife between children and parents. We wouldn't see all the strife between nations. We wouldn't see nations arming uh, with nuclear bombs and then threatening to uh, utilize those if, if they don't get their way. Man is not born loving man. Now, it is true that even by nature, we do love those who show some kind of interest and love toward us, but that's love for ourselves. And that's the reason why we like them is because they do good things for us. But we do not love them. We do not have this kind of care and concern for them. We need a change of heart. We need God's grace. We need the gospel. Only God can give this kind of heart through his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you haven't had this change of heart, then there is only one way that you can gain it, and that is through Jesus Christ. You must trust him because only he can change that heart and make you new within. Now, Jesus says you need to love God and you need to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these, and those two commandments are a summary of absolutely everything that the Lord calls you to do. You know, the Lord makes it easy to remember your duty. Just love him and love your neighbor, but don't forget you need to do it in the way that's honoring to him. You need to do it his way. But there is one final point that comes out of our text, and it's this, that knowing that that's true and even agreeing that that's the right thing to do, that these two commandments are the right thing is not enough to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You also need to keep those commandments. I mean, consider the scribe's reaction. It wasn't like those who came before, you know, where they realized they had been thwarted and they left angry. The scribe actually accepted what Jesus had to say. He says, Jesus, you're right. There is only one God. And to love him with the, the whole heart and mind and soul and to love one's neighbor as yourself is much more than all burnt offerings and sacrifices. You see, the scribe did not side with the opposition, which believed that really all the, the burnt offerings and sacrifices were better than loving God because they had left off loving God a long time ago and kept up the ritualistic service thinking that by doing this, that God was going to be pleased with them, that he preferred the rituals. No, the Lord says, I desire mercy and not sacrifice. The Lord would rather that we do what is right than go through the rituals and whatever else we might want to offer to him, even those sacrifices that were meant to atone for sin, even the Old Testament sacrifices. It's better to do what's right to begin with than to do what's wrong and then have to seek his forgiveness through these sacrifices. And again, it's better to do what God calls you to do with regard to how he says to love than anything else that you might want to offer him. 
Now, when Jesus heard what the man said, that he agreed with him, and he was right. He said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of heaven. The scribe understood what it is that God was after in the commandments, and he even agreed with what God was after, but he still was not in the kingdom of heaven. Well, what was he lacking? Just one thing. He needed to trust Jesus Christ, and that was one thing he had not yet done. So this final point stands as a warning to us in two different areas. The first one is don't ever begin to think that God prefers just the outward motions, as it were, of obedience, which we might call sacrifices or anything else that we might choose to give him over the heart. God is not interested in external religion. He's not interested in rituals. He, he doesn't, he's not pleased by the bells and smells, as it were. Or even when we do what he actually commands us to do, if we just do those things without love, as we've already seen in 1 Corinthians 13. God doesn't want us just to come to church and worship him, going through the motions without actually loving him. It's not enough for him that we keep the commandments, worship on Sunday, and even go the extra mile and come out on Wednesday evenings for the studies or for the time of prayer. And even if we witness to others, if our heart is not in it, if those things are done just by themselves. The Pharisees are the greatest example of that. I mean, they were the most religious of all the people, the most scrupulous in keeping all the commandments. They even tithed on the garden herbs that they were raising. But they overlooked things that were far more important, Jesus says, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. They were wrapped up in the religiosity. They were wrapped up in their rituals. They were even tied up in the commandments of God. These people worship me, he says, with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They did what they did without Love, which of course shows in all the other sinful things that they actually did as well. Now Jesus does want obedience to the commandments. He does want the motions. He does want us to keep the commandments and worship and come to studies and so forth and fellowship with God's people and witness to other people. He wants us to do the right thing, but he wants the heart to be involved in it as well. As we're reminded at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 13, the greatest sacrifices we could possibly make, even giving our possessions to the poor, all of them, and giving our bodies to be burned mean nothing to God unless we offer it to him in love. So our hearts have to be engaged. It's not enough to go through the motions. The Lord looks at the heart behind the motions the same way we do when anybody else shows an act of love to us. Why are they doing what they're doing? The motive behind it is more important than the act that they're actually doing. Jonathan Edwards once said, you know, I can, I can contrive of uh, somebody building a, uh, you know, a robot of sorts. Of course, in those days, he had to, you know, his, his imagination was limited by what was available. And I can imagine that we can make this robot go through certain motions and, and even do something that God commands us to do. Maybe put some food in its hands and wheel it over to somebody who needed food and, and give it to them. But he says what that thing does isn't pleasing to God because there's no motive behind it. God looks at the heart behind the motions and not just the motions. And so he wants the right heart. We need to make sure that what we do, we do out of love. Otherwise, we're just like the Pharisees, doing things that really displease God because our hearts aren't in it. Second thing it reminds us of, that we should never begin to think that just because we know that that's true, that that's sufficient, that's enough, that's all that God desires. Knowing truth is important. It is a means to an end, but we do have to attain the end. The scribe knew what God desired. He knew what God was after. Jesus says, you're not far from the kingdom, and that's better than being far from the kingdom but he still wasn't in it. Just because you know what is pleasing to God doesn't mean that you are pleasing to God. This is the interesting thing that happens even in the Christian community. 
where we study the Bible and we keep studying, we keep studying, we keep learning, and we think that by learning all these things and by knowing all these things that somehow that makes us pleasing to God. But the problem is the more we know but we don't do makes us less pleasing to God than more pleasing to Him. Learning is a means to an end. The end is actually to do what it is that we know God wants us to do. Now this scribe knew what God wanted him to do, but he had not done it. There's really only one person who has actually done what God requires, and that is the Lord Jesus Christ. The scribe had not yet trusted Jesus Christ. He had not been clothed with his righteousness. He had not been accounted as righteous in God's sight because he hadn't trusted Jesus. He knew, but he didn't do. And if you are to be different than that, if you are to actually enter into the kingdom of heaven, you actually have to do what it is you know God wants you to do, but the only way you can do that is by doing what he didn't do. And that is you need to trust Jesus Christ. Because the Bible says when you trust him, everything that Jesus did, which is everything that God required, is all credited to you. So that when God looks at you, he sees the righteousness of his son. He sees somebody who has actually done everything that God has required. That's the only way you can fulfill this requirement. And not only that... But he also gives you the Holy Spirit so that you not only have this righteousness, as it were, by imputation, you not only have this perfect record in God's sight, but you actually begin to do what it is that God requires. You actually begin to love the Lord and to love your neighbor in the way that God calls you to do it. So again, remember that knowing the right thing to do but not doing it is not pleasing to God. We don't just you know, learn all the things that we learn to, to think that somehow I've, I've made it, I've achieved it, and then begin to look at everybody else as it were because they're not doing it, but you don't look at yourself and you're not doing it either. You learn so you can do. Those are the only people that God accepts are the ones that actually do, and you can only do these things through Jesus Christ. He's the only one who has actually done it perfectly. You need to trust him for his righteousness. And he's the only one who can actually help you do personally what it is that he calls you to do. He's the only one who can give you his spirit who will help you to love God and to love your neighbor as you love yourself. So again, the greatest commandment is to love God with all that's within you. The greatest second commandment is like it to love your neighbor as yourself. How can you do this? Only in Jesus Christ. You must trust him. And only through the power that Jesus Christ gives through his Holy Spirit. Those things have to be true of you if you are to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You must trust Jesus and his nature must be being formed in you. If it isn't, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. If it isn't, you will in fact end up in hell. You need to trust Jesus Christ and do what he calls you to do. You must be transformed into his image. That only comes through trusting Jesus Christ. So if you haven't trusted Jesus, trust him this morning. Turn from your sins. Follow him and be safe. Well, let's bow for a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us now that we understand a little bit more fully, or now that we've perhaps been reminded a little more fully of what it is he desires of us, let's ask the Lord to give us the grace actually to do that.